Each, um, each one of them is involved in the real estate industry in one fashion or another. And I can tell you, each one of them is going to bring a very unique perspective to the topic that we have at hand today, which for the term, which is due diligence. What do we do when we want to acquire an asset? So um, Glenn Mowat is going to lead off. Glenn it focuses um, on acquisitions and you know asset portfolio management for a firm called TMSA which are, is a private equity group from Canada, which has made certain investments here in South Florida. Um, Claudia Gudara is a lender at Mercantile. Mercantile? Banco Mercantil. Uh, focusing exclusively on real estate transactions. She's done everything from, you know, she's done the lending, she's done the workouts, and she's back lending again. So I think she'll give you a very interesting perspective on that. And Andrew Remick, is focused primarily more, if I'm not mistaken, on modeling, financial analysis, acquisitions, yeah. acquisitions underwriting for a firm called Crec. And um, with that, I'm going to turn the floor on over to them. And um, you probably won't hear from me until after they're done. Time-wise, we'll probably work through lunch with them. Um, stop them. Stop you along the way with questions. Yes, please, please. And. Um, we'll, we'll break for lunch after that, and then we'll just pick it up in the afternoon. And um, you need that down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right here. Can you need this on? On. Okay, you need that down. Yeah. You need the lights off. Yeah, just this one up here. Fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys. We're um. I'm going to try to give you a very basic macro overview of, of the due diligence process, who's involved, um, what's involved, and why it's important to go through this process. Um, I guess before we start, you heard a little bit about us, and we won't bore you with the details of our, exactly what we uh, were entail, but Professor San Miguel really got into the details there perfectly. We want to know a little bit about you guys, and um, I know we've met a lot of you, but just know a little bit of our audience and so we can target our... Um, our questions and whatnot to, to each of you. So if you can get, just give a quick introduction. Start Talk back to here, Frederick. Uh, name's Frederick Jackson, second term here. Uh, I'm in real estate as a realtor right now. Been in property management, happy to be here. Oh, undergrad, Alabama State University. <laughs> Montgomery, Alabama. <laughs> uh, Dylan, uh, I met you uh -huh. a while back. Uh, fourth uh, semester here, last semester. Um, not in the business right now, but I would really like to be. So I'm here to try and learn as much as I can. Tyler Kitson, um, currently my first year, first semester here, if you want to call it. Um, I work for a developer as of right now and uh, just trying to expand my knowledge. So I know that. Who, which developer? Uh, Kitson and Partners. Oh, okay. okay. Morning, Dust Sanderson. I'm a building contractor down in Miami. Uh, it's my second semester here. Uh, most of my experience in real estate has been in residential, so um, it would be more commercial. Daryl, just brief overview. Um, Daryl, um, just starting in real estate development. It's my first semester here, my first time here, and I'm uh, just looking to learn as much as I can and you know, get comfortable with it. Juan Maros, I'm from Venezuela. Uh, this is my second semester here. Uh, I'm not in the business yet. I want to, so my goal is to learn as much as I can also and in the business. My name is Johnny Stustil. Right now I'm looking to do um, commercial real estate. Uh, right now I've finished the Gold Coast uh, School and also uh, taking my state exam sometime this way. Alex Gulick. I work uh, for a developer in Boca for Couch Development. And uh, this is my second year in the program. I kind of spread it out over a couple semesters, and uh, my last term here. So, um, you know, that's it. I do accounting and asset management. Mario Pena, National Live Center. Well, this is one of my last terms, plus one more class, and that's it. A few of you already. And um, just transitioning from the military and trying to get into this. Um, Alyssa Schachter. My background's in hospitality. After I graduated from UF, I got my real estate license. I was doing that for a year, and now I'm doing market research for JLL. 
Mike Cohen. I work for a third party asset management company that handles residential bank on foreclosures for various servicers all over the nation. And um, this is my final term. Mark Branker. I um, started in architecture years ago and now I'm a general contractor and I've always really wanted to be in real estate. So here I am. Nicola Reed, my background's in hospitality, fourth and final semester, and I'm currently finishing up an internship with Greater Fort Lauderdale Alliance. Uh, I'm Robin, last but hopefully not least. Um, this is my second semester with the, with the school so far. I do an internship with a, a local family owned and operated uh, development company, and pretty much just looking to kind of branch out, do my own thing, as soon as this is all wrapped up. Great. Not today, though. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, Professor Hyde. Okay, make sure that it says on, the display on. No? Does it say on? Yeah, it says on. It's, yeah, it's on blinking, on. actually. Yeah. No, then hold it, make sure. Spell your name so I get Glenn, up. G-L-E-N. Last name's Moen, M-O-W-A-T-T. -T. And we have Claudia Gutera and then Andrew Remick. What's Claudia's Gutera. Claudia, can you spell it? G-U-T-A-R-R-A. And Andrew And guys, feel free um, to stop us at any point. And um, like I mentioned, we're just going to do a, a very brief uh, macro overview on, on the due diligence process. Um, and Claudia and Andrea, at the same time, are going to kind of um, come in and throw in their, their comments as well. Um, and at some point, um, we're going to focus more on the financing side and what lenders look for. And, and Claudia's going to speak more about that. And then um, Andrew has some, some case studies to, to go over with everyone. So um, you know, to start the process off, we weren't really um, exactly sure with the level of where everybody was in the business and whatnot so we figured to start just from, from the beginning there and, and talk about the um, timing and you know to start from there so that the property is under contract you know what is due diligence why why is it important to, to, to come up with a, a time frame of, of how long it's going to take um, and, and why is it going to take longer you know there's there's from 10 to 45 days um, is, is a typical uh, due diligence time frame um, on average it's about 30 days uh, depending on the clump, uh, how complex the deal is. Um, sometimes you may want to ask for more due diligence time just so you can get your financing in place if, if, you know, if that's the necessary um, requirement or um, you know, depending on how long it's going to take for your third party reports to come back to you. Um, sometimes you know, at, at the end of the day you're not the, the only client that these uh, third party consultants um, have. So um, you know, sometimes maybe an appraiser may take, tell you two weeks but it's going to take four weeks. Uh, your engineer report may take longer. They may discover something and your environmental is going to require a phase two. So you want to give yourself um, ample time and due diligence. However, um, especially in this market that we're in today, it's important to stay competitive and that's actually one of the major points that a seller would look for. Um, right up there with your purchase price, they're going to want to know how long are you going to lock the property up for. Uh, you know, um, are you going to tie this property up for 30 days and then back out last minute? Because that's very possible. They want to make sure that it's a quick closing and, and that they can move on to the next deal um, right away. So, um, so 30 days is your typical uh, timing. Um, as far as cost is concerned, you, you have a broker's fee in there that is typically paid by the seller, but um, it's, not, it's not rare. Um, as a matter of fact, of quite a few deals that we've done, we've had um, off-market deals that um, somebody will bring the deal to us and we would pay them a finder's fee. Um, the, the finder's fee can really range from one, four percent, depending on, on how big the deal is. Um, the, next, the next third party cost there is an appraisal. Um, typically an appraisal is about $4,500 or so, um, depending on, on the level of um, research that's required and your turnaround time, um, how complex the, the, the deal is. Um, now, I mentioned there, if, if you're going to require a market study, uh, a lot of times uh, developers will want to have a market study. Um, today, you'll pay you know around 10,000, 15,000. About 10 years ago, 
you're looking at more along the lines of twenty to forty, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a market study. Uh, but right now, it's so easy to get access to data, and um, Professor San Miguel is going to go through an exercise with you guys to show you how easy it is to, you know, to have that at your fingertips. So, um, you know, ten years ago, it was a little harder for a developer to get that information, and now it's so uh, readily readily available that. Um, no one's paying that, those kind of fees anymore for market studies. Uh, so that, that's a big decrease in, in cost there. Um, your structural engineer, between 2500 5000 um, very important to have um, an engineer walk through the property and provide some uh, property conditions report, show you, you know, anything that, that doesn't meet the eye, something maybe um, that you may overlook during your first initial uh, tour. Um, and, and I'll say at the end of the day, you know, we don't know as much as an engineer as far as, um, well, not all, of, all of us, not all of us, but uh, some of us don't know as much as an engineer as far as, you know, the useful life of what's remaining, um, your big capital expenditure items. Um, it's very important to have that. And an environmental uh, study, which um, if you're buying existing assets, it's still important to have, um, but typically you won't have to go into a phase two uh, if you're buying a traditional uh, already existing office building or retail center. Um, yeah, I just want to interject for a second. If you know you're going to be getting financing, this is a good time to also take that into consideration. And if you already have identified some lenders, reach out and, and ask what appraisal firms and what environmental firms they work with because that can also delay the process. Sometimes you'll go ahead and engage it on your own and then approach a lender and attempt to use the same information for the lender. And the reality is that lenders have a lot of restrictions as to who they work with and they have to be on the approved list. So you may end up paying twice for a report if you've engaged it and then the lender has to step in and, and engage it as well. So you said on the environmental as well? Yeah, the environmental, the appraisal, the property condition, all, all those them. reports. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um, and then lastly, there's uh, legal fees and there's really no set number on how much uh, your legal fees are gonna cost. It really, I can tell you this much, uh, never once have we uh, assumed legal fees and, and been below that. Uh, you're, something's always gonna come up, you're gonna have some, you know, back and forth with the seller, you're gonna have some issues, you're, you know, there's always um, a hefty amount of legal fees. So um, so that's the first um, bullet point there. Yeah. 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 Sure, sure. I, I asked Glenn to start the presentation anywhere in the process that he wanted and I fill in, so I, I feel kind of a need to fill in right now. So we really didn't introduce a topic, and for those of you that are new in the program, it, I mean, you, you may realize that this is you know, pretty basic, but what the class is all about is the processes that we need to undertake when we're acquiring an asset. And so, you know, the whole diligence process is is the investigation that one needs to undertake in order to make sure that they can go forward with a transaction or not. And, you know, maybe there's certain conditions that they need to remedy in order to do that, or you know, maybe they make a decision to not go forward with an acquisition, or the process is let's value what we think an acquisition is worth. So. I mean, Glenn kind of started with, go back to, you know, you have 30 days to do diligence, but what's diligence? You know, diligence is the process that one undertakes prior to closing on an asset. Now, if you go back, can you go back to the previous slide? Um, we, we really need to differentiate between transactions that are on market and transactions that are off the market. So in, in commercial real estate, a lot of times what you will see is, is a property owner will you know, make a decision and it's time, you know, we, we went through this in a capital markets class, right? When do we sell? They've already, they've reached the decision that they have come to a point in time that they need to either return money to investors, um, they, you know, maximize the value of that investment. Whatever the reason is, they've made a decision that they need to sell. They will engage an intermediary. Jones Lang LaSalle has a nice capital markets group, Cushman and Wakefield, CBRE, Marcus and Millichap, Holiday Finoglio, you'll get familiar, we'll talk a little bit later about some of these intermediaries, but they'll engage in an intermediary to market property. Those transactions are on a market. What will typically happen at that point is to facilitate the process is it will be an invitation to bid. And there will be a fair amount of work that will be done by the seller in advance of the transaction in order to facilitate that diligence process. Because different than what happens in typical middle market transactions, in real estate, the diligence is done up front. And then a price is agreed, and you really have typically a very short time frame in order to close. In typical business transactions, it kind of works the other way. You know, people make a bid, 
they'll accept and then you have time to do diligence and then you negotiate final prices and contracts and all that. A lot of times in on-market transactions, a seller will already, when they're finally getting to the final bids, tell you this is the contract that we can sign. And if you've got a problem with it, let us know. And you know, we'll we'll get into you know issues of warranties that our sellers are willing to make or not make, representations that they're willing to make or not make. But on on-market transactions, you typically have a relatively limited time frame. You don't want you don't want assets being stale. Sellers typically have an indication already of what they think the market value is, and they're going to create a data room environment which will facilitate the process for the bidders to come in and do their investigation. Okay. Now, it doesn't eliminate the obligation to go out and hire an appraiser if you need to. It doesn't eliminate your obligation to go out and engage an environmental consultant or structural engineer, but in a lot of cases, sellers will already provide a data room with very recent studies that will give you a good comfort level there, okay? Mm -hmm. Which ultimately you can turn around and engage a certain, the same firm and have them give you the, you know, the affirmation or, 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 or the comfort, right? And update their report. Or you can already engage your own, but you have a baseline to go from, okay? So that's typically what happens in an on-market transaction. Uh, an intermediary will send a call, you know, you know, let's send a notice out. People have 30 to 45 days to look. They'll call for offers. We'll go through the process a little bit later, and there'll be like a second and final or best and final. Uh, um, they'll select some bidders, and then typically when they, when they pick the bidder, um, they're looking for a relatively short window, 10, 15 days in order to close, okay? You might go up to 30, but again, the bulk and going back to the importance of you know these costs, um, you know one of the costly processes that exist in the acquisition of real estate is that you need to invest money to investigate transactions that you have no certainty that you will ultimately prevail in. And so, um, while I wouldn't argue with any of these, I would tell you that for an institutional type asset, and I was because it's there. I always use the Auto Nation building as an example. It, it, it should not surprise you that you potentially could spend anywhere from, I would say, on a very low end, fifty to seventy-five thousand, to as much as one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in 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 doing an investigation on a building like that. And there's no guarantee that you're going to prevail. And you say, how can I spend that kind of money? Well, uh, well, I wouldn't argue with some of these, right? Um, you know, you get into legal um, and you start looking at leases. You start having a law firm abstract leases. You start engaging if you don't have in-house personnel to do the modeling for you and build Argus models, right? And you know you very easily can, and because of the compression and time, people are going to charge you significant sums. And so, you know, the the the, the decision to go and pursue an acquisition is a costly one that involves potentially some sunk costs that will never be recovered. Uh, was one other thing that, right, um, um, I, I would, again, we can talk, and everyone's got their own experiences. I would tell you, um, in fact, what Glenn has stated is accurate. So um, um, brokerage transactions or, or brokerage fees are typically paid by a seller. It, it is common when we're looking at off-market transactions for a, you know, a bidder or a buyer to engage an intermediary who has relationships with property owners to try to identify transactions that they can get. Now, you know, what happens? If I knock on your door and say, hey, I like your house, I want to buy it, the price is usually not going to be the most, you know, efficient, right? Because people say, hey, I'm not really looking to sell. I haven't reached that decision that I need to sell. So there's always an expectation of, okay, make me an offer. Yeah. You know, like, it's you know, what's... Enough. What you know? What's the offer going to be, right? So, so uh, while at times, and I'll, I'll share some personal experiences in that. While at times, you you do need to acquire, and and you're put into that. Um, you know, you can't go out there, um, um, engage intermediaries, and as a seller, you will compensate them somehow. I'm sorry, as a buyer, you will compensate them somehow. You know, I would say my personal experience is. In institutional investment sale transactions, brokerage fees are typically 1% and down and lower 
depending on the volume of the transaction. So, I mean, typically what I've seen, and again, I'm looking at deals that are 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars, portfolios that are a couple hundred million dollars, and you're going to see anywhere from, you know, quarter point to three quarters of a point. You typically have sliding scales depending on the volume. So, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with what Glenn's pros because a broker's going to come to you and say, hey, I charge 6%. That's not common in institutional transactions, at least you know, from my experience. So I just wanted to sort of give you that that insight and, and yeah, no, background. That's, that's all very true. And, and I guess one of the things that I left out at the beginning is that um, the deals that, that our fund are uh, that we look at right now currently, um, we look at for value add office deals that are typically suburban uh, office buildings, you know, between 50,000 square feet to you know 150, 200. Um, so so a lot of these. Figure that you see here are, are you know the private capital side, not really the institutional level. Um, so, so Professor Miguel is 100% correct. Um, you know these fees you see um, are a lot less given the size of the the deals that we look at. Um, and and you know one of the major things is, again back to legal. Uh, so we we're a small shop. We do everything a majority of our work in house. So all the least abstracts is, is done in house. The the modeling, the um, you know putting together the contracts. It, um, so although we do have a legal counsel that we, we rely on, um, we try to rely very little on them so that we can you know, cut, cut costs and, and um, do a lot of it ourselves. Um, another thing that I, um, I, I left out there was, uh, yeah, to go back to the brokerage part of it and the off-market versus um, you know, marketed deals, um, every, every fund, every, every investor has, um, well, hopefully has some sort of business plan, a game plan. They said, you know, when looking at a deal, you, you, you go into saying, okay, well, I'm going to hold this asset for three years, we're going to lease it up, uh, and then we're going to put it back on the market. Or maybe they hold it for five years, maybe they're long-term players. Um, so, I mean, it's going to become, at that point, a, a deal that's going to be hopefully given to a, a, you know, a broker if, when they reach to the point in their business plan. If they aren't at that point in their business plan and you are interested, yes, you, you, know, you could go to approach them and, and, and discuss you know, the options of, of possibly uh, acquiring their, their asset from them before they reach their business plan. And uh, obviously money talks and if you know if, if you offer them an offer they can't resist, they're gonna most likely um, listen to you. And there's a lot of um, groups out there that, that only believe in these off-market deals and then there's others that refuse to believe in the more off-market theory. And I don't know, Andrew, if you wanna you know, jump in on, on what, how Craig looks at, at deals and if they believe in the off-market talk or not. Um, I would say being on the broker side and then now being on the acquisition side, on the, on the institutional deals, uh, only the, the seller only pays the seller's broker and that's it. So when we offer a deal at 20, or call it 15 plus million dollars, it, the fee's very small, maybe half a point, maybe a, a quarter of a point, or eh, maybe a half point, but that's only to the seller's broker and that's it. Um, the buyer will have to pay his uh, broker and that's mainly be because we're offering deals to our institutional guys who don't have, have brokers or anything else. Um, when we look at deals, I mean on off-market deals, there is no br br broker. Um, it's our in-house guys, so we're not paying a fee, they're not paying a fee, which also helps out on pricing and everything else. Perfect, and um, last thing on the slide, then we'll move on, but um, you know, those, those uh, typical third-party costs that you see there, if you do engage um, the original uh, uh, third party there, so for example, if, um, if I go back and I realize there was a environmental done a year ago, and you just need somebody to come update it, you know, you cut all those fees in, in half. Um, usually they're, they're very familiar with the asset and, and they're willing to take a, a lower fee there. Uh, any questions on the slide or everyone's good? All right, so why is due diligence important? Now, it's, Professor Sam McGowan kind of touched on it a little bit there at the beginning, but um, you know, there's, there's multiple reasons. Um, a few main ones here is uh, to avoid lawsuits. Uh, you want to make sure you have yourself covered in every way um, that this deal doesn't cost you more than, than, uh, than you have. Um, you want to mitigate the risk of expenses um, that you'll probably pay for in the future if you don't um, witness it and, and experience it up front. 
and uh, and realize that it could possibly turn into something worse. Um, you know, due diligence is very important for uh, to assist in the analysis of your investment. So so we we, we talked about it a little bit a few minutes ago, but. Um, when you first start looking at a deal, you'll run a model and, and see what kind of returns you're going to get um, with the in-place income, your expenses, um, and, and again, how it plays into your, your fund's criteria and, and business plan. Um, when you're done with your due diligence process, you should be able to revisit your, your model and, and some of the stuff that were assumptions should now become actual hard figures that you can actually rely upon. Um, and again, it goes back to your business plan there. And um, the last thing there is, uh, you know, possibly discovering any issues during due diligence that not origi originally discovered and warranted the reduction in the initial purchase price. So maybe you might find something out. Um, maybe the roof uh, has some leaks that you didn't realize was going to um, be the case. You know, when you first went and toured the property, or maybe it wasn't disclosed by the seller or the broker. Um, you know, these are all items that you want to, you know, start to make a list and say, listen, I, I'm going to need a reduction in my price. So although due diligence costs, you know. 40, 50, 60, whatever, a few, a few thousand dollars, you can come back and, and recoup those costs um, if, if, you know, it's sometimes worth it just to be able to, to, to come back and say, hey, listen um, to the seller, hey, you know, I, I was never told this, you know, before we, we got to due diligence, how, you know, now it's discovered and now I want a reduction in my price. And that's not uncommon at all. Any questions on the slide? Yes. At this point, you guys, are, you, you would already be a contractor. Right? Yes, and correct. First, so okay. yes, okay. Um, you know, before you go to contract, you want to do a preliminary um, um, financial model to make sure that the investment meets your criteria and it's, it's what you're looking for. Um, you want to, you know, do your own homework. Um, it, it really varies on the on the group how much time you want to spend doing your initial, um, you know, research before you submit an offer. Uh, I know I can speak for our group. We're very conservative and, and we'll do a lot of do, um, our own personal homework before we actually submit an offer. Um, you, you don't want the reputation in the, in the field of, oh, these guys aren't really serious guys. Uh, you want to make sure that, that your offer that you're submitting is something very, if not right on, very similar or very close to what you are actually willing to pay. Okay. And Andrew, if you want to make things um, I'm not sure. Uh, so just a few rules of thumb there um, you know, regarding due diligence. Um, I'll just go into it pessimistically. I um, I think this is one of the things I learned uh, the hard way, and uh, and I, I probably had too much um, trust in, in people, and believed oh yeah the, you know whatever the seller's telling me is true you know I'm going to take his word for it and you know everybody's honest but unfortunately in in this field and in this world I guess not everybody's as honest as, as you think they are so you know go into it and, and question every single thing that's been told to you and and you know verify and re-verify. Uh, and if something doesn't smell right, you know, keep digging and digging and digging and digging until you know you get to the right answer because it's going to get brought up. You know, whether it's from your investors, um, tenants, uh, you know, seller, whoever it is, somebody's going to bring back that same question most likely. Uh, if it's if it doesn't smell right to you, it's not going to smell right to the person uh, next to you. So, um, and, and, and lastly, there is again, um, I can't stress enough to, to utilize um, all your findings that you that you have so that. You know, don't just do the due diligence and put it to the side, but actually utilize it and put it back into your model and say, you know, okay, well, I assume this now, but this is actually the truth and this is what we discovered during due diligence and see how it affects your returns and your, and, and your modeling. Um, so, okay. Professor? Yeah. Again, I, I can't argue with what I'm just telling you. The problem that you run into is if you look at things too pessimistically, you're never going to buy a building. <laughs> No, I, I mean no. That's no, no. you know that's right. you know that's just right. that's just the way it is. That's and so, um, you know, you're you're never going to develop anything. I, you're, and I'm not in any way encouraging you to exaggerate, you know, the model that you build, right? You know, ultimately, Glenn's point at the bottom is, you know, you use your use your findings, and if you don't like the result, you can always Excel's good. You can do sensitivity analysis pretty well, you know, and uh, but, you know, definitely remember, you know, to the second point, everybody's always selling something. I always use the example, when you see CEOs of companies, you know, and whatever, coming out on, you know, Squawk Box or whatever, everybody's selling something, right? I mean, people may have had, like, an announcement with the worst earnings in the world, but they're telling you how that's all behind them, and, you know, 
how you know the next quarter is going to be better. It's like you know you, you go fishing, right? Yeah. You get it, you go to the Keys, you get a charter boat, you get there, there's no fish. And that's just it was great yesterday, you know. It was and it'll be better tomorrow, you know. So people are always selling something. So you do have to be skeptical. I don't know about pessimistic. You need to be skeptical. <laughs> what is, professional skepticism is a, the term we like to use in accounting, right? So um, um, you know, be skeptical. Uh, rely on on your instincts. Utilize the information that you get. And remember, remember, people aren't as honest. And forget honesty, right? Forget honesty. I always like, um, you know, candidly, um, when we sold our last business, uh, we presented the best picture of the business that we could find. I mean, and we would answer any question that anybody asked us about the warts. But when we put the book together, we didn't put the warts in the book. We put all the pretty pictures. Now, if somebody wants to come in and assume that there aren't any warts and, and doesn't do diligence and doesn't dig around and doesn't ask hard questions, you know, there's interesting, there's an article in the Miami Herald this morning about a piece of land I used to control, a corridor that runs from the airport down to Dayland. And um, we told the buyers what we thought it was worth. I don't recall ever having a question on, you know, zoning issues that we had, you know, uh, you know, neighbor complaints. Uh, we would have disclosed all that, but you know, people just took it for granted. Now, six years later, they're struggling with, what do we do with this? And we, we all thought it was worth a lot of money. We knew there would be challenges to developing. Right? I think they're facing those head on right now. But again, understand, people aren't going to put all the bad news in a book, and people aren't going to volunteer the bad news. They're going to tell you the good things. Honest people will always give you the answers to the questions that you give them. Mm -hmm. Nothing more and nothing less. So. Yeah, but I guess the point is nobody's going to air out their dirty laundry. So it's your job to kind of, you know, dig as much as you feel is necessary. And then when you do find something, address it immediately and, and see what is the risk that can possibly be undertaken and, and how you can get hurt. And so long as you're comfortable with that, you know, continue. Unless it's a deal breaker, obviously. but. Um, Everybody is always trying to sell something. And even in my case, where um, you know doing loans and presenting to committees all the time, they always tell me, you know, give me the weaknesses up front because I know you're always going to paint this rosy picture, right? I'm trying to sell you a deal. I'm trying to get you to approve my loan. So um, it applies at every from every angle of the industry. But you always just want to be comfortable with the downside and just um, continue to see if it makes sense. Yeah, I had a professor tell me once, and it stuck in my head, but it's it's almost like dating, and you know. You meet, you meet a girl for the first time, you're, you're going to show up with the roses and you know, you're know you going to be dressed into you know, the best or whatever. And, and I mean, it's, it's very similar, I mean, <laughs> to put it in that perspective there. Um, all right, so some essentials for due diligence. Um, and if we, I think we follow this for you know, this, this little guideline here. Um, you can really make this process a very smooth process. And uh, again, I, I made it very simple and, and try, I'm trying to keep it very basic. But there's a lot of moving parts in this time frame. You know, depending how many days you, you, you end up getting on a free due diligence um, time period, um, things can move really fast. And there's it's your responsibility if you're if you're handling a due diligence process to make sure that um, everybody's communicating, that everybody is working together. Um, you know, it's it's it doesn't take much if, if you know one if one third party uh, is off on, on, on a few dates um, and not aware of something. It can throw off the whole process, and now you just wasted all your due diligence money because the contract is not going to go through. Uh, so, so you know, make sure that you communicate that you that you manage the whole process in, in, a, in a timely fashion. Um, you know, follow up with your, your third parties. Uh, you know, make sure you can you can call them up and hey, you know, do you need anything else from me? Don't you know, don't let them have an excuse to why they can't get get a project done or get your deal done. Uh, you know, oftentimes you you know you'll hear from a, a you know property conditions report is, is delayed. Oh, why is it delayed? Oh, because you never sent me this or something, you know. And it's, it's their way of throwing it back at you. So make sure that, you know, during that process that you, you stay on top of it and that, that you keep it a, as, as smooth as possible. Um, uh, so we're, we're going to go through a little more detail um, here on the third party consultants and, and kind of a little more of what each of them um, is responsible for, um, you know, what they do why it's important, and um, we already touched there on, on, on the broker, um, and, and we'll, we'll continue going on here, um, and here's the process there. So I, I kind of broke it down to, to four um, 
main bullet points there of, of what the due diligence process consists of. And the first one there is a market analysis, and uh, I had one of the questions of you know uh, from the back there of you know, when 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 does this process start? Uh, technically speaking, your your market analysis should really be starting uh, the day you start looking at the project. And Andrew's going to show you some um, offering memorandums and, and help you guys see exactly what's involved in the market analysis uh, section, but. Uh, you know, that's the very first thing you should, you know, you should look at when you look at the DLC. Uh, how does this deal fit into the market? You know, how does it compare to, to sale comps and, and lease comps? And um, we'll get into more detail on the on market analysis. And, and the next one there is income and expense analysis. Um, again, we're going to go through each of these in a little more detail. I just want to give an over, um, overview there. Um, so back to the market analysis there. Um, you know, if you're looking at, uh, you got an OM on your desk and, and, and it looks like a nice property. You think it might be something you're fine with. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so you get an offer memorandum from a from a broker, which is um, their packet of, of how they're gonna you know pitch the deal to you. You know this is what the asset is. Um, this is um, your potential returns. Um, again, you gotta take it for what it is with a grain of salt there, because they're gonna paint you a really really pretty picture. Um, so it's up to you to, to, to go in the market and say, well, let's see, we'll, we'll see what traded in this, in this submarket recently. We'll see, you know, why did that deal trade at $200 a square foot? What's the vacancies? What, you know, what were the deferred maintenance? Uh, what, you know, there, there's all the story behind every deal. And it's up to you to go and, and dig and keep digging until you find out the, the full story between the buyer and the seller. Maybe uh, the seller was strapped for cash and, and just needed to get rid of it really fast. Maybe it was an arm's length. You know, there's, there's multiple reasons behind you know, why, a, why a sale occurs and, um, and the components behind it. And um, that also plays into to your, your cap rates. And um, I think the professor will go more into cap rates later on. Um, uh, vacancy within the stock market, you want to make sure that if you're assuming that you can lease, you know, lease up the office building in, in a year or lease the vacant retail space or uh, you want to Really be able to verify, make sure that hey, you know, I'm not I'm not buying into a market with high vacancies, and I'm going to take three years to lease this up where I thought it was only going to be a year. You want to, you know, again, um, I, I, I reiterate the fact of you know how important it is to, to really look at this stuff before you get into the due diligence process, um, and then while you're in the process, you still need to you know continue verifying, continue talking to to your brokers and, and appraisers, and um, imagine that you know just think about the market analysis as if you're telling this about this um, asset to somebody who's a thousand miles away and, and know nothing about Broward or, or Dade or Palm Beach or wherever. You want to pick, paint a picture to them that they see the real side. So the reason you're involved in the picture is not so that they can hear the story from a broker who's going to paint a pretty picture. They want you as a you know in-house due diligence um, analyst to, to really let them know the good, the bad, and the ugly. So so um, you know paint paint that whole picture to them and. and um, as far as the you know who the parties that are involved, it's it's good to go and, and speak with. Um, oh, sorry, professor. No, the only thing I was going to say is that the presentation that Glenn and, and, and Claudia and Amber are making, in a way, is not radically different than the approach I'm going to take with the class, which is we're looking at existing assets, okay? But you know the reality is this process is identical for a piece of land that's raw and vacant, and we want to underwrite for development purposes, or an underutilized piece of land, or a brownfield that we want to you know, redevelop, or reconfigure, or clean up, and redevelop. And so I, I think the approach that we're using with existing assets gives us you know, a better sense of understanding cash flow, and understanding structural integrity, understanding the market, but in as much as the process can be followed for, or should be followed for, stabilized or semi-stabilized assets, it's exactly the same thing for troubled situations or ground up development opportunities, okay? You just have the extension of, hey, there's development process involved, okay? But you need to understand the market to know what you're going to underwrite as market rents when you, you know, develop the asset, et cetera, okay? So once you become uh, familiar, familiar with certain markets and, and start to you know, attend networking events and, and, and meet different professionals in the field, um, you want to you know, make sure you grow those relationships and, and keep in touch with them because, uh, you know, you have, for example, appraisers, they, they're constantly in the market. They're constantly evaluating um, different assets and they, they know um, 
they know the market well, so you can pick up the phone and call an appraiser and say, hey, listen, do you have you know, what, some, uh, some cap rates in this market? Do you have some uh, you know, reports in this market? Do you have, oh yeah, you know, usually it's, oh yeah, we just, you know, we just did a valuation of the uh, office building down the street from there. Um, you know, we'll send you the, the comps that we used. And uh, they're very, you know, good people to, to keep in touch and, and to, to have um, on, on, your, on your speed dial there. Uh, same with local brokers. I mean, they're constantly in the market. Um, you know, they're, they're the ones who, who are going out there trying to, you know, get listings and um, they're more always, always more than happy to, to share information with you and, and uh, they hope that one day you're going to give them, you know, your listing. So, uh, so they're, they're, they definitely don't have a problem, you know, helping out. Um, and again, yourself, I mean, um, with all the information that's out there today, just online and, and at your fingertips, there's no reason why, um, you know, you, you can't go up there and search and, you know, JLL's website or, um, you know, CBRE or whoever, you know, all the brokers produce reports. I won't rely completely on one particular report, uh, but I would say that there's a lot out there and so it's up to you to go ahead and analyze it and, and start to dig deeper into each report that's uh, provided. Uh, Andrew, anything? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, again, is really relying on on the reports. I I use it more for stats, but to, re to rely on it, it, you really can't do. I mean, if you look at a lot of the reports. Reports are rent growth of eight percent one year and nine percent next year. And is that really true? I don't know. Yeah, consider your sources too. I mean, a broker's not going to um, produce a report telling you that you know the market's horrible and you know, don't you know no longer buy anything. And, and, you know, they're also not going to produce reports saying that um, you know growth is going to decrease in the, in the next year or two. I mean. So really consider your source, and and some of them, you know, aren't really uh, gathering enough data to really give a good, solid foundation. It's very macro level, um, thousand miles up. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the problem with that is in, in real estate, certain levels of information have total transparency. So, um, real property transactions in this country are registered publicly, and one has access to values. But the metrics that we use in real estate don't necessarily have that same level of transparency. So the value of that building at $50 million, to some extent, is irrelevant if we don't know what the cap rate is. Mm -hmm. And to get cap rate, we need NOI information. And that's not publicly available, mm -hmm. right? Or if we're trying to establish what are market rents, right? We know what property owners are asking for, mm -hmm. but leases aren't generally recorded in this country. They may be in certain markets under certain odd conditions, but generally we don't have the true transparency into what's happening on the rental side of the business. Right. And so, you know, that's why the closer that you can get to the brokers that are doing the transactions, and brokers with all respect to the ones here, love to talk and hey, I'm only telling you this, I'm not telling anybody else, but you know, <laughs> assume that they're telling everybody everything, okay? Um, but you know, to the extent, I, I had lunch with a friend of mine, the broker, this week, and I, I know that when he talks to me and he tells me at what level he's doing deals, I know that deals are getting done there. And and especially, and we talked about this in the accounting class, those of you have taken it, there's a significant amount of add-on activity that happens with a lease, especially given economic conditions. So, you know, rent abatements tenant improvements, right? You know, other concessions that are made for naming right, buying out previous leases, you know, you know, architectural fees, you know, et cetera, right? And so step ups, a lot of times, you know, we did actually I think we've done it when I taught the investments class, step up, you know, a lot of times you work with tenants and you give them very low introductory rents and build up the higher rents, you know, and ultimately you've got an effective rent that you're looking for during a lease term, but you know, none of that stuff is public knowledge. And so if you're trying to get a sense of what's really happening in a market, well, CoStar's got information which they do their best to get, and, and you know, JLL and CBRE and all the other guys out there are trying to put their stuff. There's nothing like having your feet on the ground. There's nothing like having properties in the market in which you're active to know what people are bringing as comparable deals. And so, you know, you need that input continually, and you know, it's you know, the co-stars of the world are not a hundred percent accurate, but they do give you a sense. You ultimately, though, have a responsibility 
to sort of hone in or track, you know, down on what the real market is, not what asking rents are the co-stars reporting. Right. So. And just, just want to add something yeah, yeah, to that. Yeah. It's um exactly all of the information that you just heard now but also the fact that when you look at a report you're looking at an average and you really need to understand where your property fits into that average so are you below or are you above an average is simply that an average so you can't simply formulate a pro forma or arrive at an opinion by knowing what on average properties are trading at or on average what rents are um, so it, it really does take a higher level of diligence and understanding uh, your submarket and more importantly your immediate comparables so it's always good to, to have those contacts to reach out to and, and the tenant interviews if you're allowed or if you're doing that phase of the due diligence process to see how happy everybody is with that property or to see other items that may be going on that are affecting that specific property which you are trying to get a hold of. Uh, another really useful um, point that I left out there is uh, rely on your old um, offering memorandum. So a lot of them have um, actual rent rolls in there with the details, in place rents, and um, although they don't, Typically, have you know what was paid to in TI and tenant improvements and least um, you know what what else whatever else. Uh, it gives you a really good idea of, of what the actual in place rents are. If you can go back and say, okay, well, I just you know looked at a um, offer memorandum here and the Gable and Coral Gables, and I know they have you know these tenants in place. I know this lease is expiring soon, and they're going to get these bumps, and they're gonna, um, it's it's a good source. And again, um, you know the brokers will have this information as well to help um, move you along the process. But well, you know, I started collecting um, all my offer memorandums and relying back on them and, and you know, going back and seeing. Because yes, you're right. Um, you know, there's one thing to have a asking rent in there, but to know the net effect of rent or what actually, uh, what are you really netting out of this, this lease is, is an important part. Because I mean, I can ask anything for, for, um, for rent, but what, what in place is really what matters. Um, and you're good. All right, so then we get to the income and expenses. Um, income is, is you know, looking at uh, the rent roll, as, as we just kind of touched on there. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing an office or a retail um, or industrial um, asset, you're, you're, you're gonna start seeing that leases are gonna get a lot more complicated. There's gonna be uh, different rights to different tenants. Um, there's gonna be different TI, tenant improvements that you're gonna be um, offered for different tenants. and depending on what stage of, in the real estate cycle the market is at, it's gonna depend you know, how much how much commissions, or how much uh, concession, um, uh, concessions are you gonna offer, how many um, TI dollars are you gonna offer, you know, how, what, what kind of condition is the building already in. Um, but it's important to go through that rent roll and really go through each line item and, and verify, okay, this is the square footage, okay, this is the, um, the rent they're paying right now, what are they gonna pay three years from now, what are they gonna pay, um, and again, this all goes back to you know putting it back into your your, your original model and, and you know just um, you know justifying and, and, and changing what needs to be changed um, to to really give you good help on on the income side. You, you know, go ahead and get your lease abstracts and um, some some companies you know their legal team you know, will do their lease abstracting. Um, I, like I mentioned before, we, we do that in house. Um, Andrew, do you guys do it in house? Uh, if D depending on timing, yes. Okay. And house. Yeah, I mean, it depends how big. I mean, if, if you're dealing with um, an institutional, you know, uh, hundred million dollar office building, uh, it's going to get a little more complicated than the, the deals I, I, I do. So, so I, I think that's a big um, component in, in the leases that you want to go through item by item in the lease and make sure you're not missing a major point that can really cost you in the long run. Yeah, and ultimately, for those of you who don't know, I mean, a lease abstract is is a summary of the principal economic implications of a lease transaction. And the reason that we like that is because ultimately we've got to reduce what a very thick legal document could be down to a series of inputs that can go into a model. So what tenant allowances or improvements are still due, what rent increases are available over time, what renewal options are there, what rights exist. And so um, uh, there's there's two reasons. Uh, ideally, as, as, as both Glenn and Andrew said, is if time permits, one should abstract, one should review all the leases in an asset they want to acquire in-house. Why? It's going to give you the maximum level of knowledge. Why would you use a law firm to do it? I, I think I, I give you two principal reasons to do it. One is time. You get a building, they got 80 tenants, you, you got to you know, start modeling 
and you just don't have enough manpower in house to read all those leases, right? It costs you money, but you go to a law firm and they put 15 associates on it, and they get them done in you know two days or whatever. So that's number one. Number two, uh, depending on the type of leases that are involved you may be able to get better insight or not miss things by having somebody who's more trained in the old leases, you know, do it. If you have a full-blown acquisitions team, you're always looking at leases, you know what you're looking for, you're comfortable. All of a sudden, a deal pops up out of nowhere, you don't really have an acquisitions team, you know, you got, you got some property managers, you got a couple development managers, you got a CFO, and that's not what you do every day, and all you got to review 30 different leases that are, you know, out of three different forms because there were three different ownerships along the way. You know, they're not common, they're not standard. You can miss something that's critical. And so, you know, sometimes it pays to invest the money and hire people that are more accustomed to dealing with, um, you know, with, with legal documents. Again, that's an internal decision to make and there's a cost associated with it. But one needs to know what they know, and they need to know what they don't know. And they need to know when they need to make an investment, and they know when they can do something in-house, right? You know, do, do I change the oil in my car, or do I take it to the dealership? It's not that difficult. If you've got the tools, and you've got the experience, right? If you've never done it before, you know, maybe it's just easier to pay 20 bucks at whatever, quick loop or whatever you get done. And with that said, the abstracts are something that you have to do because beyond the rents and the increases and in the options, it's also what else is in the lease. So does Publix have have the right to go dark? And can they stay dark, which then affects your other t t tenants? Can you recapture that uh, space? Uh, does it say that you can't have a deli or a restaurant, whatever it is. So knowing that when it's usually not in the OM, you need to know that up, up, up front because your assumption might be, okay, I'm gonna put a deli here and this here and this kind of, of restaurant. A lot of times, Publix won't allow gyms. So if you have a 20 to 1,000 foot vacancy, can you turn that into a gym or whatever else? Yeah, and, and whether you do it in-house or, or um, you have a legal counsel do it, at the end of the day, it, you know, it, it needs to be somewhat brief. You know, um, really honing in on the important dates, dollar amounts, uh, the, the major facts. I mean, there's no point in doing an abstract that's 10, 15 pages long. I mean, it should typically be a page, a massive, maybe a page and a half of, you know, imagine just giving it to a uh, CEO and saying, hey, what do you think of this? And they, they should be able to go through each uh, lease, you know, 80, 100 leases there and see all the major facts and be able to tell you within an hour, you know, all right, these are things I'm worried about. Uh, that's the ideal, you know, situation there. Um, and Professor, if you can touch, I, Professor Sam and I were, were discussing last week, and, you know, if you buy in on the, on the fact that, you know, you're buying real estate as appreciation, uh, an asset that appreciates, and, and you're buying in on an income stream, you know, can you touch on, you know, the importance of why it's important to, to, to do the abstracts, if, if that's the way you're, you're looking at the asset as a, uh, you know, future stream of income. Uh, uh, do you remember that conversation? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I hope I answered it right. I, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, we talked about a lot of different things, but ultimately, and we'll get to, I mean, we'll, we'll work on all this stuff, it, you know, as the term evolves, but one of the things that we need to understand is is the role that we have in our, in our tenant spaces, right? Because ultimately, the potential upside or the potential risk that we have when we acquire an income stream is what's our ability to market that to market, right? And so a lot of times a seller is going to try to entice a buyer by saying there is a, an opportunity to mark the rents to market, i.e. the in-place rents are below market. In, in growing economic times, that's generally the case, right? Auto Nation signed a lease there eight years ago when you know the building was 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 built. You know they may have had you know two percent increases in rents. The market may have gone up thirty percent in rents in that time frame. And we'll, we'll try to analyze a little bit of the supply and the demand part of the paradigm. But it's important to know at what point in time that lease expires 
and what the outcome on my income stream is going to be. You know, as, as we talked about in the capital markets class, real estate is is a financial asset, and a financial asset is worth the net present value of its future cash flows. We talked about that. We talked about how transactions can only clear at that point because a buyer is only willing to pay that net present value and a seller is not willing to sell below that net present value. And so we talked about you know that financial component. So then when we actually calculate what that net present value is going to be, we need to understand the revenue component of that. And that revenue component is going to be impacted by the time frames in which leases are remarked and it's also going to be impacted by the time frame in which leases roll off, that we need to re release the space. Okay. Now, uh, what I do also want to mention is, is it because I probably won't mention it again in the class, we also have economic times in which the market market opportunity is negative. Okay, and, and you can say, when can that be? So put yourself in 2008 when all of a sudden I'll just give you a market industrial rents in. You know, the airport west or out market in Dade County plummeted probably 40%, right? Uh, two things were happening in that in that time frame. Number one, any lease that was coming in was going to roll in <laughs> at a significantly lower amount. But the second one is a lot of tenants were going to a landlord and saying, hey, I know my lease isn't up, but what are you going to do for me? And if you don't do anything for me, you know, I can go bankrupt and, you know, uh, and, and, and unilaterally, the single largest landlord in the market, which is now called Prologis, it was A and B before, it was just unilaterally, just to keep occupancy, was dropping market rents, you know, on open leases and renegotiating with, you know, 30, 35% reductions just to keep the tenant base and to keep the tenant base happy. And so, again, that's not typically what you would find you know, when you're buying. Hopefully you're buying and it's good times. And, you know, maybe in retail, we looked at, you know, the, the lease terms in, in the, that Simon property, or Simon property mm -hmm. case study that we did in the accounting class, right? Retail leases, in some extent, are very, very long. And so, you know, stop to think a, a Sears is expiring in a mall and it's signed, you know, 30 years ago, right? What might the mark to market opportunity be? I mean, you, you've seen the um, the leasing spread, the difference between the new leases going in and the outgoing leases, right? And Simon's always going up by significant sums. Why is that? Because the leases are so old, you know, they're 20, 30 year leases after all the extensions that have been signed, that there really are opportunities to revalue that cash flow, right? And so real estate winds up being like a fixed income instrument, but like an equity in that the income stream isn't fixed and continually, hopefully, can revalue, be revalued up. So again, going back to what we talked in the capital markets class, that's why it's a good inflation hedge, because as inflation rises, rents rise, and that income increases okay so it, it does it does allow you to protect your value against rising prices so i don't know if i answered no, that's that. perfect <laughs> but we're tying in you guys will see this class ties in a lot of the concepts that we talked about in the other classes and hopefully as i've said you know out of boss used to say when you speak tell the people what you're going to say tell them and when you're done remind them what you told them okay so reinforcement reinforcement of concepts hopefully you know creates you know knowledge awesome um, so no matter, no matter how many um, you know abstracts you do and how well you do it um, what you're not going to find out in that abstract is is what the actual tenants are thinking so it's important to go meet with the tenants um, you know maybe you sit down with the tenant and he tells you you know what this this uh, new retail center opened down the street and uh, you know, I was looking at the rents there and the traffic count and everything. It was making so much more sense to me. So, you know, my lease is going to be up in a few months, and I, I think I'm going to go move there. And you know, that's something that is not in your lease. You know, you, you know, again, verifying your assumptions. You, you, now you, you realize that there's a 95% chance that this tenant's going to leave. Um, and you know, later on this this class, you'll you'll start to focus in more on, on Argus and and Excel models and, and spend some time there. But you know, that's all going to play into to 
to all your assumptions there, um, is your individual meetings with tenants. Maybe the tenants are going to tell you about an issue that um, obviously the broker is not going to bring to your attention and, and the seller is not going to bring to your attention. Uh, but maybe he's going to tell you, you know, oh, well, um, the property is poorly ran. Okay, that's good. That's good for you because you're going to come there and, and you're going to build that morale up again and, and, and get the building running back to where it should, should be. Um, so, you know, your tenant interviews are very important. Um, I, I highly recommend, you know, you go through each and every tenant and, and you know, you show face too. That, that always helps with, with tenants. Maybe you sit down with that tenant that was going to leave because of the poor management and you sit down with them and, you know, you, you convince them, hey, can you stay, you know, sign a six month, a year at least and, and you know, give us a chance to, to prove that management's going to, you know, better things. And go ahead. Are you going to touch on estoppels at all or no? I, I don't think so. No, go ahead. But I can't. I could point to. It's not directly tied to that. By the way, I'm glad you're touching a lot of these because I may not revisit some some of these as the term goes on. I have a lot of cover, and and so even if we just touch on some things, and I say uh, what I say in all the other classes that there are topics that we touch on one day that you're not fully satisfied with. Let me know after class, and then hopefully we can spend a, a fair bit more time on the next one or answer any questions or doubts that you have. Um, you know, Glenn's point on the interview is very, you know, important. I don't want to minimize you. You know, you know, ultimately your tenants are your income stream, and revenues are the number that everything else is deducted from. So if you don't have revenues, you don't have a business. Um, a lot of times you hear information, which could be positive or negative, just just on an interview. So, you know, it may be yeah, these guys do a bad job, but it may be hey. They're not in compliance with the lease, right? You know, I have this obligation. I can tell you, and you will see a case study soon, soon, uh, in which a, a significant expenditure was not disclosed that was required by a landlord, was not disclosed by the seller, but it was uncovered during a, a tenant interview. Now, in addition to the tenant interview, um, typically what commercial leases will require is a is a tenant to provide an estoppel letter in the event that the building is sold, and that estoppel basically is an affirmation um, that a tenant makes, or a statement that a tenant makes in regards to their standing with the lease. And so, um, there will be a form. Typically, attorneys fight over this. You know, the the buyer's attorney will say, "Well, we want the tenants to say this," and then you know the sellers will say, "We don't want them to say that," or and, or you'll negotiate in a contract, we want 100% of the tenants to provide an estoppel, and uh, the, the seller will say, no, no, we only want 50%, and you know, only one major one, and you know, you wind up with, you ultimately would like to get estoppels from all of your tenants. It's hard chasing tenants down. It's hard getting people, especially when you have national tenants that somebody locally doesn't have you know, the, the power or doesn't want to have the power or doesn't want to help, right, to get somebody, you know, to write stuff down. But ultimately, you are looking for affirmation from a tenant on the lease. You know, this is in fact the lease that's in place. We've had this modification A, B, C, and D. We're currently on modification D. Again, in Estoppels, we've come across um, transactions where the seller and, and I'm going to assume not necessarily out of malice, but just, you know, mm -hmm. you know, just people make mistakes where we've not seen the most recent lease renewal. And so we're modeling, and they've modeled a particular transaction, which is not the current lease that's in place or the modification that's in place. Um, and you're looking for things like compliance, you know, of all tenant improvements, you know, or all expenditures been funded, right? I mean, I, I came across a building once um, where there was an issue with parking that had been promised and not delivered. And it ultimately caused the seller to take the building off the market for a stupid little thing. But, and actually, that, that, that wasn't even that. It was the property owner somehow was somehow tied to a, a broader um, um, cross easement access in the development where they were. were overflow parking from a hotel was allowed under parking and so like once a month there would be parties and then people would come to work and they couldn't park because the parties were happening but ultimately the building had to be taken out of 
of the market. And that came across a, a tenant estoppel. I mean, the building was under contract, and somebody came out and said, listen, you know, there, there's a problem. We've been guaranteed, you know, five spots per thousand or whatever. And we can't get them because of this issue. And ultimately, the property eventually sold a couple of years later, but the owner had to go and renegotiate this other agreement before they could make the property marketable. So, so, so estoppels are something that everybody should get and should be required as part of a transaction, and that's prior to closing. So that's after, after you negotiate the sale, you've entered into a binding agreement, then the, the, the seller has the obligation to obtain these estoppel letters from, uh, from their tenants. Is that, is that clear? Make sense? Just one question. Yeah. So what exactly is the letter of the state? Uh, well, you negotiate what the letter says. So, you know, you negotiate with the seller what you can ask the buyer to represent. But typically you're going to ask them to represent the lease that's in place, right? The latest modification that's in place, the lease rate that's in place, any increases that you have. Again, anything that's ultimately going to end compliance with the lease that's in place, okay? So ultimately you want to say, yeah, look, yes, we agree that we're bound by this lease. We agree that we pay this price. We agree this lease expires on so-and-so date. We agree that we've got these increases. And yes, we agree that we're up to date and that, you know, nobody owes any sum. You, you can, in estoppel letters, put sums that are owed from one party to another. You know, we're three months behind on our rent, you know, uh, because we've got a dispute over this. Or we've withheld this from our rent because we've got a dispute over this. Uh, you, you typically want confirmation of the economic conditions. You want compliance. And you generally leave an area open for the tenant to spew whatever complaint they've got. Because yeah. ultimately, that's one of the few areas um, in real estate transactions where you can, and I, I don't like this word, retrade uh, transaction. In, in real estate, the word retrade is used a lot. It, it, to me, it implies a lack of honor. I, I, it's one of the things I don't like about the real estate industry. I, it's very common in, in, in the development you know, realm. People agree to a transaction, and then we retrade it. And, and it's used in a very sort of inoffensive, you know, it's matter of fact, well, things didn't work out the way we wanted it, we got to renegotiate. I, I, I personally find a general lack of honor in that. You know, if you agree to something, you do a diligent job up front, you know, you're a man, you, or a woman, you know, you, you know your word, your word means, you know, what you say, you, you, know, you say what your words mean, and, and you follow through. Uh, but typically, as I said, because in commercial real estate transactions, bidders or potential buyers are given an opportunity to do diligence in advance, there is an expectation that once one agrees to a price, you're going to close at that price, and there's no retrading. And I'll contrast that to typical general middle market transactions in which people bid for a business with very light preliminary information. But the expectation there is, is that in diligence you're going to come up with something where you're going to retrade. I, my brother's trying to buy some, what do you call those things, Auntie Annie's, like 22 of these things or whatever, which means I'm going to be part of that deal, right? <laughs> Uh, but you know, the other day he was like, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah," because they were already agreed on a price. But now he's starting diligence. So I, I called him up. He goes, "Oh, you know, I might be really busy because, you know, whatever reports coming in, and you know, we're gonna start to, you know, we're gonna start some very serious discussions about the purchase price." There is an expectation in operating businesses that after a price has been agreed, because you haven't done diligence yet, the hair is gonna come out, and then what you think you're gonna get is not exactly that. And the way you beat up on it is the cash flow. You try to find holes in the cash flow, right? You know, what revenue was expected that isn't there or what expect what, what expenses that weren't forecast or anticipated, you know, gonna be there, or what capital expenditure. So what's impacting cash flow. But you know, going back to um, um, you know, here's one of the few places where you've got an opportunity to go back to a seller and say, hey, the cash flow isn't what was represented or diligenced. You know, hey, I know it wasn't on purpose, but you didn't give us the latest lease. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, 
And again, that's happened with us. Or, hey, you guys did tell us there were $400,000 of un unpaid and committed PI that we need to come up with. Okay. There's other places too when you start doing, you know, lean searches and things like that. But this is one of the few areas with the stopples that you actually can, you know, tangibly go to a seller and say, hey, we got to re renegotiate this price because it's not what we anticipate. Um, it may sound like a pain to do, and, and it, it is very time consuming to, to and, and difficult to get um, established from all your, your tenants, but it's well worth it. Um, you know, a deal we just closed on recently, um, we spent a good week going back and forth with, with one of the, a big tenant of ours that was a, a national tenant that they had their form and what they wanted to use, and we had our form. And they, every time we requested a stop, well, they'll send us that. And we would ask them, you know, can you please send it? It, it goes back and forth and back and forth. Um, but, you know, it, at the end of the day, it saves you a lot of headache. Um, it's, it's easier to get that stuff discovered while there's a current, you're not the owner yet, and the current owner is still in the picture. You can go back to the owner and say, hey, listen, this is, because at the end of the day, you didn't do the lease. You, you, didn't, you didn't construct that lease. So if, if you can go back to the owner and, and say, um, you know, there's something wrong here. Where it's a gray area. There's, there's got to be a way to, to, to fix this problem now. Then to when after you take ownership, and then you have to deal with that. It's it's better to get it all out in the open, and um, it's 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 an easier process that way. And I, you know what? I mean, it, it's actually really surprising as well on, on the same deal that um, management wasn't even aware of a lot of the leases that a lot of those leases that we uh, were in place for for years um, before the previous um, owner. And um, they weren't even aware of a lot of, of it. At least that's what they claimed. I, I don't know if they're just making that up or not. But it's that's why it's really important to go through this. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on, on the line there of, in TIs and, and future payments that are required. Um, so so going through your um, uh, estoppels are great. And also on the lending side, if, if you're going to get financing, there's no question that they're going to require uh, estoppels. So um, in this environment now, it's, it's good to take advantage of, of what banks are out there lending on and then uh, you know if, if, if that's the route you're going to take I guarantee you're going to they're going to check every little detail on that, uh, on that rent roll and every little detail on that property um, correct? Yeah. Um, anything else on the stop with you guys? Um, okay next thing there is service contracts uh, you want to go through the service contracts that are in place and make sure that uh, the previous owner didn't hire his friend to do some work that is really unnecessary and he's got a 15 year contract because he's friends from high school with this kid and you know it, you, you always want to go through each contract and make sure you can get out of those contracts if not you know the next month at least within the year and, and, and make sure you're not you're not signed up for anything that that you're you, you don't want to weigh down your your income I mean at the end of the day the more you have in your expenses the, the less income you're going to get there so so you want to check that and uh, the most important part of this whole income and expense analysis is, is checking your, your audited uh, financials. That's, those aren't going to lie. The, that's the trailing um, professor who would probably be better at, since with his accounting background to go in more detail on this, but um, checking the, the, how, the, how the asset performed the last year and the year before that um, gives you a great idea of what it's going to do in the future. Um, and, and those are audited financials that you know, are required. Um, and, and Professor, anything with, with the financials? You know, I want to talk about some of the three things. Um, um, the, the first one, let me let's just wrap up on the service contracts. You need, you need to distinguish when you're acquiring an asset, whether you are acquiring an asset or you're acquiring an entity that owns an asset. And you know it's no different again than you know traditional middle market transactions in which I would tell you typically as a buyer one would always prefer to acquire an asset and acquire it through an entity that you're creating with the right structure that you want for yourself or the right tax structure that you want for yourself but more importantly a new entity that may not have any you know, baggage associated with it as opposed to acquiring an entity that owns an asset. So again, that asset could be a real estate asset, but it could be an operating business, it could be a hotel, or it could be a restaurant, or it could be anything else. And so, why do I bring that up when I talk about service agreements? Because um, service contracts, 
may be with an entity, and if you're acquiring an entity, you may not have an opportunity to get out of them. As opposed to a property management firm that, <laughs> nervous? <laughs> that manages. So, you know, one of the things that, that we tried to do was, uh, through our property management business, enter into all the service agreements on the assets that we managed, whether we owned them or not, through the service company and always find a way to, you know, have 30 day termination clauses on them. Uh, you may or may not be able to acquire that. And, and, and why is that important? Because um, if a service agreement is not advantageous, and you're buying an asset, you want to get out of it, right? And as a seller, you want to be able to provide that level of flexibility as well. You know, and it's, you know, like that's always a negotiated situation, right? A vendor may not give you a very, you know, ideal, you know, setup, and they don't have a long-term commitment associated with it. But um, there are service agreements that are easy to get out of. There are service agreements that you will necessarily need to get out of. Utilities, for example. Right, so you know, one of the things that you need to do or should do, depending on the municipality or, um, or, or the utilities involved are structured in such a way that you enter into a totally new agreement and somebody comes and reads a meter the day that you're acquiring. And so you, know, you don't really care so much about what may be in place. You just need to make sure that you've got the service that you need the day that you acquire. On, on the audited, uh, profit and loss and the budget. One of the many different things I've done in life is I, I, I set up a diligence practice in Latin America for Ernst and Young. And it was a business focus. We, we did a couple of large real estate transactions, but it was primarily you know, operating businesses. And one of the things that we offered as a, as a business was not only an analysis of what the historical, the trailing information was, but year to date, because um, the, the best time to put a business up for sale or an asset up for sale is when you've had the best results. But that's always in the past. And so what happens is just even three month trends in certain areas, you know, hey, I may have had a great, you know, last year, but all of a sudden I just, lost my biggest customer. There's a company called GT Technologies, um, symbol GTAT, GTAT. Anybody heard of them? Made a bunch of money on that stock earlier this year. It went from like, it went from like two to like eight, and, and I sold it. And it wound up at 16, and I felt like an idiot. But what did G, GT Technologies do? Sapphire. Right, so they, they, or they were, going to be a Sapphire uh, supplier to Apple. And Apple agreed to loan them 400 million bucks, and they started building a plant. Did they, bankrupt? Did they, bankrupt? they went bankrupt on Monday. They filed for bankruptcy. Stock went from like 14 to like 79 cents. You know, $2 billion worth of market value blown up. Why? Excessive reliance on one customer. Customer decided to go with a different vendor. Again, we don't, they're, they're, there's obviously more that will come out. There'll be lawsuits and people figure out what happened. But in real estate, you rarely have just one tenant. But you may have great operating results, right? But all of a sudden, you know, a major tenant is skipping their rent payments. Now, you may eventually find out when you get an install, right? But last year isn't necessarily as important as, as what's happening this year. You need to take a look at both. Now, um, it, you know, is that important? Well, it's probably more important that you understand a property management business and your property managers get together with the people that are you know, doing the underwriting so that you can balance what history has been, especially on the operating expense side, with what you think you bring to the table. Okay? And again, that may or may not benefit you economically, right? If you're in an all-net lease you know, environment, operating efficiencies that you bring to the, you know, to the bottom line just get passed on to the tenant. That'll ultimately help you because you, you'll want more. You, you'll get more tenants because they're in a more efficient operating environment, right? But to the extent that you're not in an, uh, an all net deal, there may be some economic efficiencies that you bring, you know, that, that, that um, um, come to you. But it's always important to take a look at history 
as a good indicator of what's going to happen in the future. Um, you know, one of the things that also is important, especially when you live in Florida, what are you, property taxes. So what's the impact of property taxes on the sale and on my operating statement going forward? And what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis my recoveries, right? Because again, you know, for those of you that, you know, haven't addressed gross versus net leases in other classes, you know, the question is, is going to be on a hook? And things like base years have impacts on this, right? But operating, um, operating expenses are going to be impacted by property taxes, okay? And the second one, which is a big concern here, is insurance. And so the insurance that was in place in a building before may or may not be the same insurance that you can get, right? So if... Oh, while well, with insurance, yeah. um, that company that owns the property now may have some sort of umbrella insurance um, that's under, you know, they're paying a lot less because they have 20, 30, 40 assets that they, they have insured with this um, insurance company. So, you know, although it's, it's a good indicator to, to look and see, um, it's, it's right. your home or it's your job to go and, and get a quote from an insurance company. Right. right. And so that's, you know, history is the best indicator that we have in the future, but it's not the only thing that we should look at. Okay. So just make sure that, and it's not only that an institution may have owned it that has $300 million, you know, of coverage across a bunch of different assets. It may also be that it was being managed by CBRE, which has, you know, two million properties that they're managing and are extending, you know, a, a, a significantly better rate than what you can offer if you're going to manage the asset yourself. Now, the other extent to this where you may not get this kind of information and you may have alternatives, start stepping down from the institutional level and start getting into more mom and pop businesses, right? So. I'm going to go buy, on a personal level, a 15,000 square foot office building, you know, on Coral Way in, you know, in Miami or something like that. And I, you know, it's being marketed by like a Remax residential broker, who knows the owner, you know, totally non-institutional, non-standard, you know, type deal. There's most likely no audited financial statements. And then they're going to present some financial statements that may or may or may not ultimately tie to what their tax returns are. Because of what you typically want to ask for as well, especially in smaller transactions, non-institutional transaction, is tax returns. Because 